Not only were they still basically children in comparison to some of those eighth graders that were so large and already uh, developed, but then they had to learn new terms. The entire academic process was notched up um, and they had to memorize all sorts of things and learn all sorts of new terms, terms like hieroglyphics and iambic pentameter. And they had to memorize all sorts of stories and histories and, and then they had to answer in essays how well they memorized th their, these things. And I want to share with you some of the uh, answers that sixth graders have written down in their essays. Teachers have uh, this ability to put funny things on the internet. And a sixth grader wrote that ancient Egypt was inhabited by mummies. <laughs> and they all wrote in hydraulics. <laughs> and they lived in the Sarah Desert. This next one actually has it 100% right. I hope he got full credit for his answer. Socrates was a famous Greek teacher who went around giving people advice. They killed him because they didn't like his advice. <laughs> After his death, his career suffered a dramatic decline. <laughs> <clears throat> the great writer of the Renaissance was William Shakespeare. He was born in the year 1564, supposedly on his birthday. <laughs> he wrote tragedies, comedies, and hysterectomies. <laughs> and I think the same child wrote, the next great author was John Milton. Milton wrote Paradise Lost, and then when his wife died, he wrote Paradise Regained. <laughs> Johann Sebastian Bach was one of the most famous composers in the world, and so was Handel. Handel was half German, half Italian, and half English. <laughs> Much larger in life, I guess. Well. I went ahead and taught for a good 10 years. In those 10 years, I have so many stories to tell. For a short time, I taught at a high school called Miami Jackson Senior High, and it was basically an inner city school. As an inner city school, they did a very good job of intimidating me, and I had to do a very good job of not showing it. But um, I had a different type of way of teaching. My pedagogy was a little bit more creative. I was very innovative. I, I didn't really uh, use the same old traditional methods. And some of the teachers there didn't really uh, quite agree with my teaching methods. And I, I, I kept on hearing and harping that I wasn't using the vocabulary book and that I wasn't using the, you know, the grammar and the syntax and so forth. But I, I really would get my kids uh, to uh, imagine. I was all about, you know, have it stirring their imagination. And then from that imagination, they would have to write. I was very much a writing teacher. And through their writing, they would learn. And there in that school, I made a friend, uh, Mr. Gomez. Mr. Gomez ran the detention, detention center. He was in charge of every kid that ever got detained. Um, and, you know, so if somebody misbehaved, they went to detention, and there they would see Mr. Gomez. And Mr. Gomez actually had a very no-nonsense approach of loving the kids. Very no-nonsense approach of loving them. And he's a very interesting person. He was independently wealthy. He did not need this. He ran several um, commercial uh, buildings, and he collected rent from a lot of commercial properties. He didn't need to teach, but it was his calling. And he placed himself at an intersection. He positions, positioned himself at an intersection where these kids would need him the most. And so one day, Mr. Gomez went up to me, and he introduced himself, and, and I already knew who he was. And, and he said, I, I've heard about your teaching. I've heard about the way that you teach, and I want to send a student to your class. Now, the thing about it is it had taken me months to get my class in order. It had taken me months to get them to do things the way that I kind of did. And I had, you know, a time for free writing and I had a time for creativity and so forth. And it was all very different. And after all these months, the kids were like they were in it. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, my God, he's going to send me some, some kid that's like a bad apple. and He's going to disrupt everything. So I kind of really, really hesitated and I pushed back. But he told me why, why he wanted to send this kid to me. This was a kid that was stuck in detention. Couldn't get out of detention. Every time he got out of detention, he would get sent right back. And he goes, this kid needs to graduate. He needs to get out of this. And the thing is that this child had already failed the 11th grade once. 
and he was in jeopardy of failing the 11th grade a second time. And the statistics were that at that age level, a second failure in life would mean basically he would drop out. The chances of him becoming a dropout were like astronomical. So I went ahead and I took him into my class. And I'm not going to tell you that it was easy because it wasn't. I mean, the kid was a handful. And I remember sitting with him and telling him what the rules were and what my expectations are. And, and then I explained to him this whole thing of how we use our imagination and so forth. And it was all very new to him. It was very, very different to him. And I remember this kid perfectly. But I have to admit that I have forgotten his name. It's an occupational hazard. After I, I must have been a school teacher for about 4,000 kids. And I could see him. If I were to meet him today, I would recognize him. But his name completely eludes me. Um, somehow or another, we made it. We made it through the year. He passed. He went on to his senior year of high school. And I went on. I went back to uh, teaching middle school. And I became a, a middle school teacher again. And I was back in the middle school. And so I didn't get to see him again. But I remained friends with Mr. Gomez. He was a bit of a health nut. And we, our paths would cross in different places in Miami. And I would see him getting a smoothie and so forth. And one day I asked him, Mr. Gomez, what about that kid that you sent to my class and so forth? And he goes, oh, yeah, I haven't really seen him much, but I know that he graduated. So it's really my hope that this kid overcame his limitations and that he was able to become a good and productive citizen. And that somehow or another, between Mr. Gomez and I, we helped him along that path. Now, it's been 25 years since I taught at Miami Jackson Senior High. It's been 25 years since... I befriended Mr. Gomez and became a pastor and I've got a much larger group of people whose names I know all of them, <laughs> right? And I hadn't really thought about Mr. Gomez. Hadn't, he hasn't even crossed my mind. <clears throat> hadn't thought about that kid who was sent to my class late in the school year. That is until the Parkland shooter's face of Nicholas Cruz was put on the television screen. And I got to tell you, he had the same look. It's the same type of look of a kid that's been stuck in detention. The same kind of look of, 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 of a child that the system <clears throat> is not working for him. And I, and I saw that kid, and I got to tell you that my heart just kind of just crunched. I said, oh, my God. And I was transported right back to that time in my life when I was a school teacher. And I was thinking about Nicholas Cruz, Cruz because you know what? Every school system has a child that's in one form or another is similar to Nicholas Cruz. Every child and every school system needs someone that just takes an extra step, makes a little bit of an extra effort, says, you know what? This isn't working for this kid. Let's see if we can put him in a different class with a different teacher. Let me see how we can work with him to get him through because obviously he's not going along at the same time and same rhythm as everybody else. And I know that a lot has changed since I was a school teacher 25 years ago. I know that budgets have been cut big time. I know that there's been all sorts of curriculum changes. But I wonder, is there a Mr. Gomez out there? Is there a Mr. Gomez in every school that is keeping his eye out on, on those at-risk kids. And the at-risk kids are the ones that are not only at risk of failing or at risk of dropping out, but are at risk of becoming a societal hazard. I know that lately there's been a lot of opinions as to what we should be doing with the schools to prevent another Nicholas Cruz. I know there's opinions out there about school teachers having to carry a gun. I gotta tell you, you give a gun to my wife, she'll shoot her toe. <laughs> you give a gun to me, I'll shoot a parent. <laughs> but I have to tell you that the day that we think that the solution is to put more handguns in the schools is the day that our civilization has failed. It is civilizational failure to go the route of arming too much. And you got to ex expect that from me. I'm a peace-loving pastor, right? So I'm going to go ahead and offer something a little bit different. 
Instead of putting handguns in the schools, how about putting more Mr. Gomez's? How about getting more people that are like Mr. Gomez, who have this calling and vocation in life, who like to be positioned at the intersection of a kid's life to make a difference? How about allowing for more, more creative and innovative teachers to teach in a creative, innovative way without having to teach to the test? Because that's basically what's happening. It's all been moved to the test, and they got to pass the test, and so teachers are now just teaching to the test. Another layer to this is that the community has to get involved. The community has to get involved. We just cannot say it's the school's problem. It's the superintendent's problem. When I put, drop off my kid at school, it's the teacher's problem. No, it is every single one of our problems. And this is where I'm gonna go back to the scripture reading from the book of Ruth. From the book of Ruth, we have Ruth expressing words of covenant. What does it mean to be in covenant? And she describes it. She says, wherever you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. For our setting here in Pinellas County, it means your child will be my child. Your problems as a school teacher will be my problems as a citizen. Your problems with violence will be also become my problems with violence. We just cannot pass the buck. Passing the buck is not a Christian thing. Jesus says that we must love one another with abundance, not just enough so that somebody else could take it. I have to tell you, I'm very, very proud, very proud to be serving here at this church. I already knew about this church before I came two and a half years ago. I knew that this was a church with a fantastic youth program and that the youth program ministers to a whole community of children, children that come from all walks of life, not only from the families from within this church, and that through that youth program, we are in covenant with families and we're in covenant with the school system. We are providing for those kids what the schools may not be able to provide. We are providing for those families a new vision, a new way to use their imagination for a kinder and gentler world, a world where people actually care and love for one another and don't just pass the buck and blame, try to find somebody else to blame for the Nicholas Cruz's in our lives. Indifference is sinful. Indifference does not allow us to love our neighbors or to make a covenant. When we make a covenant like we did today at the baptism, with this baptismal family that's been part of our church for decades, we are covenanting not only Keith's position as pastor or my services as associate pastor or the youth group and Jeannie, we're covenanting each and every one of us. Take a look at the baptismal vows that we read together. It's basically the same words from the book of Ruth. Your child will be my child. I want to share with you a uh, story that comes from Africa. Africa has so many wonderful stories. And uh, this one comes somewhere from the center part. And it's called the rat trap. This is rat. And the rat was going everywhere throughout the farm. The rat knew everything. They scurried about. The rat was going into the farmhouse, into the barn, where the pigs would be. The rat was so good at moving around. And the rat could see everything. And then all of a sudden, one day, the rat saw the farmer's wife take a rat trap and place it behind the piano that's close to the kitchen, right where the rat tends to uh, run around. And the rat saw that and he got all alarmed. He went running back, he went running back to, to the barn. And he said, there's a rat trap in the farmhouse. There's a rat trap in the farmhouse. There's the chicken. The chicken's just clucking away and scratching at the soil. And he goes, what's that to me? What's that to me? I spend my day here scratching the soil and looking for corn and laying eggs. I've been laying so many eggs, I don't have time to worry about your rat trap. So the rat's all alarmed. He goes running and he, he runs over to the pig and he goes, pig, pig, there's a rat trap in the farmhouse. There's a rat trap in the farmhouse. And the pig says, I'll pray for you. 
I think I've got a little prayer for you and I'm going to keep you in my prayers. And then the pig went back and started to continue with its slop. And so the rat was not satisfied. He knew that wasn't going to be enough. So then the rat went running and, and he saw the cow and he went up to the cow and he goes, there's a rat trap in the farmhouse. There's a rat trap in the farmhouse. And the cow, just as cows do, was indifferent, didn't even see him. The cow could have been, had been in front of a passing train. He wouldn't even seen it. And the cow just turned around with indifference and walked away. So time passed. And one night, late, late at night, all of a sudden you heard a it's the rat trap closing. And the farmer's wife woke up in the middle of the night, all excited. And she went over behind the piano to check and she put her hand back there. And then all of a sudden, she realized it wasn't a rat, but a um, big mamba snake. And the snake got her. Poisonous, poisonous snake. And so now the farmer's wife has this big swollen hand and the venom is running through her body and the farmer's all worried about it. And she's got a fever. She's got this fever that won't go down. So everybody knows that when you have a fever, one of the best things for a fever is chicken soup. <laughs> chicken soup. So the farmer went over to the, to the barn and got the main ingredient for the chicken soup. <laughs> but the woman kept on getting feverish and kept on getting bad and just would not, would not improve. And so she got really sick and he couldn't take care of her. He had a whole farm to run and so he called her sisters. And then he goes, sisters, come on over here. You know, my wife has fallen ill. Why don't you come and take care of her? So the three sisters all came and they set up camp. They moved into the house and they started to take care of her. So now there's more mouths to feed. And these, these women, they were hardy women. They like to eat. And so all of a sudden, the farmer realized, I got to feed these women. He went over to the barn and he goes, pig, you're looking nice and fat. So he got that pig and cooked it for the sisters. Lo and behold, the farmer's wife didn't make it. You're supposed to go, oh, oh. the farmer's wife didn't make it. And she was much beloved, much beloved. The entire town was grieving her passing. And so they all said to the farmer, we're coming for the funeral. And the farmer is like, oh, he goes, oh, my God, the entire town is coming for this funeral. What kind of reception am I going to have? How am I going to feed this entire town? And then all of a sudden, he saw the indifferent cow roaming around. And he ordered for the cow to be slaughtered so he could feed the town. Moral of the story. Somebody tells you there's a rat trap. If there's a rat trap in the house, you better pay attention. Because it may not affect you directly, at least not yet. But eventually, it might go around to affecting you. Friends, there's more than a rat trap in the house. We've got children stuck in detention. We have children killing children. We've got an entire system that's been broken for so long after so many different presidential administrations saying they're going to fix it, and it's still not getting fixed. Something has to change, and I think the change has to be with us here at the church. We must get involved, more so than through our youth program, more so than through our Sunday school program. We must just do a little bit more. And we know we're, we're already doing plenty. We're doing plenty, and it's running very smoothly the way that my class was. We got it down. It's working very well. We know how to give and where to give it, and we know how to make it work, but it's not enough. It's not enough. We're living in times that we call for us to step up our game. And let's, let's not do it with indifference. Let's do it with love. So that those children that are stuck in detention, for those families whose lives are not going anywhere, for those people who somehow or another can only resort to violence because nothing else has worked, they might know of a community that they can belong to, a community that they can lean on, that's creative and innovative, that, yes, has rules and expectations, but there's room at the table for them. Because at this table that Jesus has laid out for all of us, there's always room for one more. Amen. Amen.